Ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, welcome to the open forum. Labour wanted, locals preferred. That's the subject of our evening session. I think it is a very important subject. We're going to be dealing with migration and particular migration of labor. I'm sure that we all remember that Europe for centuries had many problems. Europe was a labor exporting continent. Now things have turned the other way around and we're importing labor. Let's just take a couple of figures between 1820 to 1950. 50 million Europeans uh, traveled overseas to set up a new life. Today, 20 million migrants are coming into Europe. As far as the north-south migration is concerned, we've now got an additional factor, which is east-west migration. The history of migration shows that when economies, when countries, when societies have needs, perhaps even selfish needs, then they have always looked for labor, they found labor, they've asked labor to come to their countries. Often they have uh, had to work in uh, precarious conditions. And that's when uh, the uh, host countries started to react with irritation. And that's also the source of problems. We all know what Max Frisch uh, said once about uh, the relationship between Switzerland and uh, Italians in the 1960s. We call for labor, and what came instead were people. In politics, the term migration has always been used by populists. And migration has been pillared as being a source of danger. Governments in different countries often react in a very passive manner, even though, though defensive reactions are often different amongst the population. And in many cases, uh, flows of migration are not regulated. The authorities just let it happen closer and I because they, they know of the advantages. Now we know that there are many advantages for entrepreneurs, for uh, the economy, uh, for the uh, society of uh, the country uh, receiving the migrants as well as uh, the uh, sending countries because they send remittances back home. More than 120 million migrants are on the road somewhere in, in the world, primarily in Asia, quite a lot in Africa and only 5% in Europe and only about 7% uh, as refugees. So the majority is labor migration. We know the elite migration, that is to say well-qualified people, women and men who are looked for and who find jobs in other countries. And we know the modern slaves, uh, house workers, sex workers, cleaners, etc. Then there is legal migration legal labor migration, uh, people who migrate in order to marry. And uh, we also have a uh, problem of uh, family reunification. We also know irregular forms of uh, migration where people just stay on beyond uh, the terms of their visas. And there are also people who come in through human traffickers. Migration policy throughout the world is something uh, that has uh, to be dealt with throughout the world. We need a policy, not just uh, negative uh, coalitions uh, with people simply uh, trying to ward off uh, the flow of refugees. And fortress uh, Europe has become something of a buzzword. We need to have a policy for migration and for refugees and asylum. So these are just some of the catch words at right at the beginning of our discussion. We've got a full hall here today for this open forum. And we've also invited uh, some uh, guests. They wanted to come in in greater numbers, uh, but uh, the bus was held back in uh, the uh, valley. And so a couple of hundred people who wanted to come up couldn't get through. We regret that because we're an open forum. But some people did manage to get through the 
police cordon and I've asked Rolf uh, Coffey from uh, the uh, human rights uh, organization to come and make a statement because for them this is a very important subject. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, Mr. Bricci was saying, we wanted uh, to use uh, the evening and enrich it uh, with a bit of a, a demonstration and we wanted to be able to participate in the discussions and we wanted to, to also get people whom you're going to be discussing and who can't be present and who have no voice, namely the migrants. We got authorization to stage uh, this uh, demonstration, but we weren't able to organize it because one coach with about uh, 40 people on board was uh, held back and wasn't authorized to travel to Davos. And on that coach, there were a number of speakers who would have spoken for the migrants. The reason why the bus wasn't allowed to get through to Davos is the following. Obviously, there is a, a bit of a security regime in operation and we were asked that all participants in the coach had to show their ID cards. They wanted to have a, a, prevented, a preventive ID uh, check in spite of the fact that they were coming uh, to an open forum. And we think that for reasons of the fact that we are in a state of law, we think that that's not acceptable. We don't think it is possible or acceptable that people should submit to a control because they simply want to make use of their democratic rights and to take advantage of freedom of speech. In this particular case, uh, these are foreigners, people who don't have necessarily an established status here in Switzerland. and. This could, of course, have a, a negative influence on the way their dossier is going to be handled in Switzerland. So the bus couldn't travel on to Davos, and the migrants haven't uh, been given an opportunity to speak here. We're not going to say more about it than that. We just wanted to, to uh, mention this point. We've already uh, made our point to Mr. Brecci. And uh, we think that we need to have new standards, even in this open forum. Thank you. We're going to organize a session this evening, and we're going to start with the, the panelists speaking. And I'm going to try and ensure that uh, we spend about half an hour with uh, opening statements by the panelists, and then we will have opportunities for you to ask questions or make comments. We have uh, illustrious people sitting up here on the podium. I'm not going to go through all their CVs. I just would like to go straight into the discussion. Govida Sami Rajasekaran should have come from the Malaysian Trade Union Con Congress. He couldn't uh, come, but uh, Philip Jennings from Union Network International is with us. And my first question goes uh, to him. What are the consequences and risks of uh, migration movements? Mr. Jennings. You are committed uh, to defending the interests of uh, labor worldwide. What are exactly, in today's migration flows, the big risks that you see? What are the risks for the migrants, but also for labor in host countries? Well, I apologize on behalf of Mr. Rajasekharan, who is not here uh, from uh, Malaysia. And on behalf of the uh, trade union delegation present in uh, Davos, I would like to express my concern and also some anger that people from Switzerland, living in Switzerland, they may have been Swiss nationals, they were obviously from other countries, weren't able to make the visit to this evening's uh, open forum. The theme of the World Economic Forum this year is building trust. And it doesn't send a very trusting message to people who want to come and share this evening with us. We are a global union, and it's part of our job and duty to give a voice to working people from whatever nation 
from whatever nationality, whatever their gender or sexual orientation. And I would like to say at the outset that as an organization, along with all social movements, we condemn, we abhor all forms of racism and discrimination. And we, as a union movement, believe that we can stamp out racism and discrimination at the workplace, whatever your color, your religion, or nation. That's why, as far as we are concerned, as an organization and as a movement, we have to explain to the world what is happening with this globalization process. We have a globalization of markets, of companies, of finance, of technology, and of transportation. We have to get out of the state of denial that we're all in, that we can believe we can work with a policy of zero immigration. It does not work. We have to find ways and means with a basis of human decency and of truth and of justice of dealing with this. If we have zero tolerance, you drive those labor markets underground. You develop criminal networks. They exploit children. They exploit women and mothers. Therefore, as far as we're concerned, we have to have a new framework, new ways of thinking. And all of us here in this room and elsewhere have to develop a new mindset with respect to accepting others, being tolerant of others, being tolerant of other cultures, and that we should condemn those politicians that exaggerate the risks. What we don't like to see is employers who exploit the situation. We call them the invisible workers, the people who work in hospitals at night, that clean offices, that work in hotels, not always documented, exploited by employers for more profit. It's as simple as that. We have to speak up for these people. We go and organize these people. We go to these places of work to find them, to talk to them in their language, to get them involved, to say that the union movement is a safe haven for you, that you can learn about the labor market from us. And we also say to employers, to, those, to the employers who have the reputation, is it really good for your market and for your business that you are condoning this type of practice? Mr. Jennings, but, shouldn't you talk rather more about uh, salaries, pressure about on salaries in your function as a trade unionist? Now, I, you see, I don't like this debate, and you've already the debate that immigrants force down wages, that migrant workers somehow weaken the rights of all of us. I would prefer to have a more fundamental discussion that we have to realize with the structure of the economy that we have today, the way the world functions today, with an enlarged Europe today, this is an inevitability. What we want to see is fair labor standards. What we want to see is that if people come into nations, that the collective agreements are respected that the agreements negotiated by the unions apply also to migrant workers. Wolfgang Auwerte Kuhn. Wolfgang, Wolfgang Auwerte Kuhn is right on the left-hand side. He is uh, head of the board of uh, the Kuhn AG. And uh, it was... Uh, a um, metal working uh, facility originally. You are the representative of uh, employers basically here. Mr. Alvata, in your company, you have had quite a lot of uh, interesting experiences. In 1964, a large number of uh, refugees came into Switzerland and a lot of people found work in your factory.
I think you have special experience with this. What do you say about uh, the subject of this evening, labor migration from the perspective of an employer? Thank you for giving me the floor, Mr. Bechke. Let me just emphasize that there is uh, a different world, not the world necessary that the previous speaker was speaking about. And I'd like to speak about this other world, namely an employer who is attempting, where possible, to address the issue to the best of our possibility. We have 150 people in our company, so obviously we can't change the world. I think that that is uh, something we have to bear in mind. What we did, and I'd like just to broaden the debate, together with uh, the federal authorities, together with government, together with uh, the Swiss Red Cross, we have tried to bring into Switzerland people who wanted to, to work here. We wanted to provide them with a home. And it's people who really came from a different uh, world, basically people who'd lived in the Middle Ages. A lot of people who came to Switzerland had never seen uh, uh, flowing water, had never seen a toilet, and didn't even know how to use one. Obviously, they didn't know our language. And we didn't know their language either, incidentally. Now, of course, this is going back a long uh, way. But uh, for 30 years, we have uh, been able to gain experience. And we have been able to show that integration is possible, that it does work, and it functions. And it functions legally. And I think that uh, we are also respected uh, by the local staff working in our company. Susan Martin, C. Sing Direct. Susan Martin, you are director of the Institute for the Study of uh, International Migration at Georgetown University in the United States. You are here as a professor who specializes uh, in this area. In fact, I think you have uh, been looking at the problems of migration since the uh, beginning of the 1980s. And you have been studying uh, a number or you've been studying the problem in a number of different uh, institutions. And you've been looking also more specifically at women's issues. Sie haben jetzt, uh... You've heard two speakers already. You've heard the employer's representative and you've heard the worker's representative. You represent not just your university, but you also are a government representative to a certain extent. What could you share with us in terms of your experience? Well, um, as with a uh, number of academics in the United States, it's not unusual to move into and out of the government. Um, I did direct a federal commission on immigration for the U.S. government during the 1990s. Um, so I bring both an academic and a public policy point of view to these issues. And um, the the difference of opinions that were registered here is certainly the difference of views that are registered and discussed um, in the United States. Interestingly enough, though, in the U.S., um, the, our major union uh, federation, as well as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, our major uh, federation of businesses, have come together with regard to proposals um, to ensure greater rights for uh, migrants who are in the United States, particularly those who are without papers, without documents, um, in order to ensure that for business there is a constant supply of the labor that's needed and for the labor movement that the rights and working standards and wages of the migrants are equivalent to those of native workers. Um, so I think there is a convergence of, in of interest um, in this respect. And I think the reason for that um, is that there is a very real and as well as a perceived need um, within more developed countries um, for tapping into an international or a global labor market. Um, there are lots of reasons for this pressure right now. Um, they include everything from the fact that there is economic globalization. You have multinational corporations moving their staff from one place to another. One part of their company to another may mean crossing international boundaries. Um, you have greater 
integration of the economies. Um, U.S. and Mexico have certainly been moving in that direction. Labor integration becomes a part of that process. EU has been experiencing very similar um, um, process as well. Uh, the demographics, which the chair mentioned at the beginning, are certainly an important factor. Um, growth continues in the developing world in terms of population growth. Many developed countries, however, are seeing a leveling off or even a decline in population um, projected over the next few years. But even more important, we're seeing an aging of the population. And some fundamental questions are being raised as to where will the taxes come from to pay for the growing um, burden of pensions as the older native residents retire and expect to have um, their lives you know, continue and, um, and be enhanced in retirement. Um, we also have lots of networks now. Um, because of the ease communication, transportation, um, it's just a lot easier for people to move from one place to another. Um, we also have the dark side of that, um, and that's the proliferation of smuggling and trafficking networks that exploit migrants um, to bring them into um, countries in order to place them in sweatshops or place them in brothels or um, other very bad forms of employment. Um, so with the, all of those pressures continuing, I think the obligation on the part of governments as well as corporations and unions is really to figure out ways of managing the movements of people. The worst thing you can have is unmanaged migration, where people come in in large numbers, have lots of local impacts, people have to experience what does it mean to suddenly have people who don't speak the language living in your communities. When it's unmanaged, it raises xenophobia, it raises concerns, and these are often very, liter very, very serious concerns and very legitimate ones. Um, but where it's planned, where there's a public understanding that the, migra that the migration is chosen, that it's meeting specific needs, um, then it's much more likely that it's going to be accepted. And then I think also that there'll be a much greater likelihood that the public will support humanitarian programs to protect refugees and others who really need um, to have the protection from persecution or from conflict. Susan Martin, Sie geben mir... Susan Martin. I have organized uh, people in a particular way so that we can have different points of view. So thank you, Susan, for that. We have the representatives of international organizations on my right, and these are people who deal intensively or exclusively with problems of migration. Let me start with Ms. McGinley, who is Director General of uh, the International Organization for Migration, IOM, in Geneva. He has uh, had a diplomatic uh, career in Europe and in Asia. He's been a uh, an ambassador, and he's also been a specialist in refugee and migration issues. And he was U.S. coordinator in Bosnia as a humanitarian coordinator, and he was elected director general of IOM in 1998. Mr. McKinley, today we had a visit, and I made that point to you earlier on. We have young people who've come along uh, today or wanted to come along in order to uh, address some words to you. They're saying that the IIOM is not really an NGO, but a QGO, that is a quasi-government organization, and uh, that you are simply representing the interests of state. In other words, you're trying to manage a migration on behalf of governments. And that would be the wrong way around, people say. A lot of things are being done the wrong way around. And uh, you're trying to organize voluntary returns. It's not a question of human rights that you're trying to protect, but it's just a question of managing these flows. What can you say about that? Uh, Hannes Britschke, uh, I, would, I would start by saying uh, something a little bit off that particular question, which um, <laughs> is that I'm very happy to be here indeed. Um, uh, and to be able to uh, to talk to all of you a little bit about uh, migration and migration management, which is what I do for a living. And uh, um, I'll come back to uh, what IOM is, if you have the patience, uh, to to hear us out. 
But I, I want to tell an anecdote or, or two first. Um, for starters, uh, I am myself a uh, migrant worker. I uh, am a citizen of the United States, but I have come to Switzerland and I have lived here for the last four years, uh, earning my bread and supporting my family in a, a job in a foreign country. So I am myself a, a migrant laborer, and there are a few others uh, on, on the panel. Didier Cherpitel, he didn't make uh, quite the long trip that I did, but uh, uh, as a Frenchman who lives in Geneva, he's also part of the phenomenon. phenomenon. Mr. Auwert is from Liechtenstein. <laughs> Mr. Auwert is from Liechtenstein. <laughs> Mr. Jennings is from Wales, Wales. by uh, Wales, part of the United Kingdom. As you know, yep. so we're we're all in it, and we we all see it from the inside. Now, here's another anecdote. I am particularly happy to be sitting here in the Schweizerische Alpine Mittelschule because uh, 31 years ago, uh, I came to visit my brother here, who was a teacher at the. Schweizerische Alpine Mittelschule. And uh, at the time, of course, he was also a, a migrant worker, right? He had come to Switzerland, an American citizen, to teach English and to teach uh, German to non-speakers of German. And he was very well received here in uh, Davos. Uh, he loved the place. He left only uh, very reluctantly a few years later. Uh, but uh, he's the one who first brought me to Davos uh, as, a, as a, a foreigner working in Switzerland where he had a very good experience and, and I have a very good experience too. Okay, I have to admit that we're in a, a rather special category because we're people with some education who, uh, who know how to play by the rules and who are filling jobs that uh, Switzerland is quite happy to see foreigners come and take. But, but we're not elite so, migration. Yeah. Well, oh, okay. If you, if you, if you <laughs> want to use that word, I would not. I don't think of myself as an elite. But yes, okay. We have certain advantages, and it's easier for us than it is for people in other categories. But, but the 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 phenomenon of an elite migration, indeed, migration at all different levels, is growing pretty fast now. You know, in Switzerland, uh, I think most Swiss people think of migrant workers as occupying the lower end of the job scale. And that is true to a degree, but it's, it's not exclusively true. Migrants are now coming more and more to occupy a lot of different levels in, in Switzerland, and they're contributing quite a lot, and they're very well integrated into your uh, hospitality and uh, tourist industries and the rest, and they're playing a, a useful role there, and, and they're sending money home, and it's, it's working very, very well. In fact, Switzerland is a rather good model of a, a country in which labor migration has been made to work pretty effectively for the benefit of the country as well as for the benefit of uh, many, many migrants. And, and so it's, it's, it's not by accident that so many people want to come to Switzerland and are trying to get into Switzerland, including some people who don't really have what it takes to contribute and survive here. I think we've got to, all of us, the Swiss, and, and, and all of us in the world who are trying to, to make sense out of the 21st century have got to start uh, looking at realities and rethinking some of these old conceptions a little bit. Um, I'm going to stop there on the general thing to get back to, to uh, Hannes okay, Kritschke's I, I question. Mr. Uh, McKinley, I can put it in another way. Just what's, I mean, I, I understood it's what a kind of tough questions, but what is the main target of IOM in, uh, in, 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 in the in actual world? What, okay, what good. Well, that one I will answer. Um, in a nutshell, by referring you all to this piece of paper, which I think you have because we put a lot of copies of it out on the desk out front, this is our attempt to, to answer that question on one piece of paper. It's, a, it's a, a chart of managing migration. And what it, what it shows you at a glance is 
that there is no really simple answer to that question. Yes, mm -hmm. we do work closely with governments. We are an intergovernmental organization. We, uh, we represent governments all over the world. Uh, Switzerland is a, a member government. Most of the European uh, uh, states are members of our organization. But we also have members uh, all around the world, and we're adding members all the time, especially from the developing world. Why? Because the developing world sees migration as one of the keys to its success in the future. So I mean, it's hard to manage, but it's, it's not impossible. And, and we get involved in every facet of this. And one of the things that makes migration so interesting is that it touches on the lives of so many people in so many different ways. It's economic, it's social, it's humanitarian, it's governmental, it's policy, it's health, all sorts of things get drawn in. We try to, we try to cover the whole spectrum and it's, it, it isn't easy, but it's very, very interesting. Didier Scherpitel, Sissing uh, General. Didier Scherpitel, your General Secretary of uh, the International Federation of uh, the Red uh, Cross and Red Crescent Societies. You are a politologist. You have uh, been a banker for many years, uh, working at J.P. Morgan, and now you're Secretary General of the International Federation. And uh, you are also involved in migration issues. What is your contribution? What does uh, the umbrella organization of the IFRC do? What we do, in fact, is to bring to live along our principles, primarily based on humanity, impartiality, and independence, to help as much as we can the most vulnerable people. And we leave that through our principle in 178 countries, of which the Swiss Red Cross is part of. When we talked about the vulnerability, because that's what we're talking about, indeed, what important element here on migration is, over the last 25 years, the number of migrants, legal and illegal, have doubled. They represent 150 million, maybe more, 40 million of which are deemed to be irregular, as we call them. So clearly, they are extremely vulnerable vulnerable for discrimination, persecution, lack of education, and even worse on occasions, lack of access to basic health services. And this is something we at the Red Cross or Red Crescent societies, not only we fight, but also we make sure we help them, we assist them in the most terrible moments. And indeed, on many, uh, for many of us migrants, not only they did change place on earth, sometimes many of them lost it. They lost their place. They lost their chance. And clearly this is terribly dramatic. And as far as we are concerned, we are credible interlocutors to those vulnerable population. We are safe interlocutor because we are the Red Cross we live by our principle, and you are talking about intolerance, racism, discrimination. This is clearly something we fight, in, even internally to our organization. But vulnerability, vulnerability has dramatically increased. And we help them whenever they need, at the local branches, not in headquarters and big cities, but where they are, where they need us, whether it's health services, education, uh, detention center just to help them on the papers because they don't speak the language, whether it's in Spain for North Africans, whether it is in, uh, in Philippines, we have to be there. And talking about Philippines, migration creates other type of vulnerability we don't think about. Seven million Filipinos live abroad, leaving 25 million children without their parents in the Philippines. That's another kind of vulnerability in terms of education and make sure the children will get the right education. This is the kind of thing the Red Cross is doing, will continue to do, and more than ever, because this vulnerability increase will be present. Daniel Biedermann. Daniel Biedermann, you are director of the Swiss Red Cross. You are replacing another person who is going to come from uh, your organization. And I think that you are one of the main organizers of this panel. So perhaps my question to you, 
why has uh, the Swiss Red Cross organized this issue? Why did you choose this? Thank you. I think a lot is spoken about uh, the effects of migration also uh, within the context of uh, WEF, and I've heard a number of uh, lectures or presentations on this, but very little is actually said about the causes and about the specifics of that migration. I think that what you really need to know is that when people are living on a dollar a day, Obviously, in most cases, people can't actually live. They just survive. And as long as there is such imbalances in economic terms, in our um, uh, quality of life, and obviously people have a right to the same uh, right uh, to social and economic uh, justice. And as long as there is this differential, as long as uh, that exists, there will always be migration. We speak a lot about migration flows. There are lots of theories that are put forward, but very often we forget the individual destinies of individuals. People who leave their countries of origin, people who are sometimes forced to do this. There used to be a distinction between voluntary and involuntary migrants, and I think that this old definition has to be jettisoned. Somebody who, for reasons of hunger and who wants uh, to find a better life elsewhere, can also be considered as being an involuntary migrant. I think it is normal that people should have the right uh, to look for work elsewhere, that they look for security elsewhere, that they look for a home elsewhere. And I think that there is one human right which is very important. And that human right is the right to mobility, to leave one place and go to another, particularly if you feel you're no longer secure or that you can't live somewhere. But there is no immigration right. There is only an emigration right. And that is precisely where we find that national states are, are trying to prevent this happening, at least the decisions as to who is going to be allowed in, how many people are going to be allowed in, who is going to be allowed to enter our countries. This is a sovereign decision by each nation state. And that is precisely where we have one of the big difficulties. Globalization hasn't taken place at this level. You've got waves of uh, labor being uh, brought in. And we see, of course, waves of migrants arriving. And there may be natural uh, reasons uh, for this, for example, natural disaster somewhere. But the consequence of this is that uh, there is an arbitrary element uh, in, in involved. And certain people can get in officially, but others are forced uh, to become illegal migrants. And in the Swiss Red Cross, this is one of the main challenges we face. I think this is one of the biggest problems in our work in the field of migration. It is not dignified when people are forced uh, to uh, live in dormitories. In many cases, they're exploited, either because they're very poorly remunerated or because they're not given proper health care. They can't go to hospitals. They can't uh, take out health insurance. This is an inhuman existence. And we feel that that has to be combated. And if there is a, um, a problem that has to be solved, we need to do something about it. I'd like to ask you, Susan Martin, something. Why do you think that governments uh, have such difficulties in uh, regulating uh, these migration flows? You were saying that one of the most important uh, things is to regulate uh, migration, that is to say legal migration, to uh, have regulations and laws. You have been in uh, government uh, committees. Why is it so difficult? I can speak primarily um, about why it's difficult for the United States. And if it's difficult for a traditional immigration country to manage this process, I think it, it exemplifies the problems generally um, in the world. And I think that there's a fundamental ambivalence about immigration. Um, on the one hand, many of us who are more fortunate um, like having 
less expensive fruits and vegetables because migrants are coming in and picking them at lower wages than might otherwise happen. We like the fact that we have lower prices at restaurants because the people who are cleaning the plates are doing so at low wages. We like having you know, lower costs for hotels, construction, all of these things. We as a society in many ways, um, and it's both quantitatively uh, measurable as well as quality of life, benefit from having immigrants coming in. Um, in the US, certainly, um, we all have rose-colored glasses about our immigrant heritage as ourselves. I'm the daughter of an immigrant. Um, so I have a particular feeling that immigration is good. I wouldn't be here and living the kind of life that I live if it hadn't been for immigration. So there are lots of reasons we're in favor of it. But on the other hand, it's a very, very difficult issue to deal with on an emotional level when you're surrounded by people who don't speak your language, who have different cultural values. Um, today, in the post-September 11th situation, I think there are very legitimate security concerns because we often don't know who is the person who has come into the airport who is trying to cross in um, to our country. Um, and so that ambivalence means that on the one hand, and we want to control immigration, make sure that nobody who's not supposed to come in comes into the country. But on the other hand, we want the benefits of the fact that often the immigrants are doing things that we don't want to do um, or that businesses don't want to invest in. Um, technology, for example, to become more productive without needing an expensive labor. Um, so there are a lot of reasons. The, the second thing, if I could just continue for a second more. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I would like to go on because it's an interesting point. Uh, Herr Auwerte. Mr. Auwerte, what would you say? Is there something in the economy as a kind of complicity with this kind of situation to the extent that uh, we simply delude ourselves? Because these are, of course, cheap uh, workers. Just think of hotels, restaurants, uh, farms. You get workers being paid a very small uh, wage with very little uh, insurance and governments just turned a blind eye because it's convenient, because it contributes to the economy. And people don't really want to regulate because everybody stands to benefit. Now, I think you're talking about very specific sectors. Yes, so the sectors, of course, are in the limelight. That's quite true. But uh, if you look at uh, my sector, you see that there are many of us who make sure that we respect rules and laws and we only take on people who have uh, papers. That is a condition because otherwise, if we don't do that, we are subject to such high fines in Switzerland that we would really run into difficulties if we were not to respect the rules. We employ people and we get assurances from the authorities that are, we're going to, go to get uh, uh, an authorization. So that's one aspect. That is uh, so far as the industries that I represent are concerned where we deal with documented workers. But there are other sectors and industries and just take uh, farming for example. And uh, our company also operates a farm incidentally. And we are always grateful of course if we can get uh, somebody who's doing a traineeship uh, and he, somebody comes from Russia or from Brazil and they come spend a year with us. And we can uh, get people who are prepared to work uh, at uh, relatively low wages because that's the only way the farmers can afford uh, to pay them. But at the same time, these people come along and learn something from the farmers. And we also know that farmers in Switzerland are no longer prepared to work at those low wages. I'm sorry if I uh, prod you a little bit, but you said uh, quite honestly that you have uh, a subsidiary in the United States that you're very successful and you had problems with the management and you said that one quarter of your workforce are Im illegal migrants. So it's not just something that's so specific to a particular industry, but even if you don't really want to do it, you can end up in that kind of situation. 
Now, of course, I spoke about the situation in Switzerland because that's my basis. As to the case in the United States, we built a new facility on a greenfield site. It's a completely different uh, activity. It's uh, a spinning uh, factory in Georgia. And we had uh, to recruit a workforce from one day to the next. And we couldn't do that so easily because, after all, we weren't uh, uh, in our own home base. Uh, we had to find locals. And we outsourced uh, the activity. And uh, we asked a, a local company to uh, find uh, employees for us. And after six years, we decided to take over responsibility directly and to set up a human resources department because we realized that uh, out of uh, 190 employees, uh, about uh, 29 were illegal uh, migrants. But the management succeeded, and uh, people had been working in the United States for a relatively long time. 25 of the 29 could be legalized, and they're still working in our spinning factory. That was four years ago. And the remaining five, I don't know why we couldn't get papers for them, but they disappeared. I'm not asking uh, if uh, the illegals uh, were getting a uh, different wage, but you, Mr. Jennings, tell us, what do you think uh, we should be demanding of companies, particularly when we bear in mind uh, that we have to have equal rights, equal rights at the workplace? And I'm not talking about the gender issue. I'm talking about uh, the uh, advantage that may be given to locals over migrant workers. What are the demands that are being put forward by trade unionists? You know, there's, uh, we've seen during the course of the last year something sadly lacking in management practices. That is honesty, integrity. Objection and transparency. No, I, was, I wasn't, I, I was very interested to learn about your case. I'm going to study it further after the conference. I would just like to assure Mr. Uh, Herr Auwerter, Sie sind nicht allein. Gibt es viel? Not a lot. There are a lot of people who are exactly in the same situation. There are employers who have no time, no understanding for our collective agreements. How many people speak German here? Okay. Ich bin ein, ich bin ein Waliser. I'm sorry, I'm a Welshman. I can speak a bit of English, but I'm going to try and do it in German. I'll try it. <laughs> what do we want? We have labor standards in Europe. We have collective agreements in Europe. And we want the employers to respect these agreements. The agreements are not always wonderful. Somebody working in the commerce sector in Switzerland, for example, they earn perhaps 3,000 Swiss francs a month. Even for the Swiss, that is not a very high salary. And then you have employers who are only prepared to pay 1,500. I'm talking about quality of life. I'm talking about an opportunities or equal opportunities. I think that the employers and the trade unions have to cooperate. It's very important. I think that governments, trade unions, and employers must work together, and we must respect labor standards. We both have a big responsibility. Employers need workers, that's clear. That's quite clear. And Europe has a problem with the demographic uh, trend. And employers have to fight against racism, against discrimination, as uh, the trade unions must do. And we've got to fight against political parties uh, that use this uh, to gain the populist vote. And this is not just something that's important. It's not just a responsibility for us, the trade unions, but it's something for society at large. Mr. Charpitel, you were saying that you and your organization uh, look after the most vulnerable sections of society. So can I ask you, what can you do in concrete terms against uh, those involved in human trafficking? 
like organized crime, these are very difficult people to get hold of. And uh, we've heard in the news all the terrible events uh, that can take place. What can you do to help the most vulnerable sections of uh, society? I suppose you're working also in this field too. I think to be very concrete about what we do, um, in 40 countries, we help specifically migrants, legal or illegal, in differentiating their nationality, their language. We don't differentiate. We don't discriminate. What we do first is we help them in just food and simple assistance on shelters, blankets, kitchen, kids, etc. That's the first thing we do materially. We can also, on the psychological side, help them because those who are disconnected from their roots usually need a lot of psychological assistance. We also let, help them in, the, in a way we call protection, where we ought to make sure they are not aggressed, quote unquote, from the outside. And we find a way to integrate them in the discussion with the authorities, getting papers or getting access, in addition to the health side I was talking about. And the Red Cross is indeed a safe interlocutor because it is very complex, very frightening, and sometimes and often illegal environment for them. This is a safe house. Sangat, you read in the papers, I'm sure, about what the French Red Cross was doing precisely for illegal migrants traveling, quote unquote, to Great Britain. And the French Red Cross had no alternative that to host them, feed them, and offer them a harbor where they can stay for some time and also find a way for solution to them. We were forced to close it under the pressure of the British authorities. And the government asked us to close it. But that's a kind of practical thing we do. But I condemn this kind of pressure because what it does is in fact is increasing vulnerability because people become then underground. They disappear. It's even more difficult for us to find them. It's even more difficult for them to find a place to live, to sleep, and to feed. So clearly we are again any kind of pressure. When you talk about trafficking, this is the result precisely of these pressures. So instead of focusing on the victim, we would like the government to focus on the reasons of this trafficking against the traffickers and be more, I mean, just implementing the rules, regulations of their country very often and be much harder on them, not on the victim. We can't naturally know any... Of course, we've only been able to just uh, deal very superficially with some of these issues. I'm sure we could uh, discuss for hours and hours and we wouldn't find a final uh, solution to the problems. But let me open up the discussion. Let me invite uh, questions uh, from the auditorium. Can you just raise your hand and we'll have a microphone brought to you. In the front, in the middle, we have a gentleman who has uh, a question to ask. Just a few moments, patience, please. The microphone's coming. Front in the middle, please. Uh, my name is Reto Satter from Zug, and I think the core problem is the education. I was working on the Bahamas, traveling a lot around the world, and always the poor people like to get more money. But I think they don't have the good access to rather education or information. So my question to Mr. Jennings and Susan Martin, how could we, or which organization could change that? I think um, education is certainly a key um, issue. I know that some of the work that IOM has done um, has been on public education campaigns in countries particularly to try to educate um, would-be victims of traffickers as to just what the dangers are that they may be getting into. Um, they've also provided information about legal 
forms of admission. I think the key issue, though, in terms of education is the education to be able to stay where you are, not necessarily to have to leave your country to find economic opportunities elsewhere. Um, and that, that's a difficult, really difficult issue. Um, one of the advantages of talking about migration at a place like the World Economic Forum is that it brings together people from the developed and developing world. We had a discussion at one of the, um, the dinner meetings about how the communities of immigrant and ethnic communities that have done well in Europe and North America can help in the development of their home communities, um, both in terms of making use of the huge amount of remittances the, the wages workers send back to their home communities to promote development. And I visited communities as distant as distinct as villages in Mexico and you know, very, very small villages in Mali in Africa um, in which the local school and the salaries for the teachers were being paid for by the immigrants in the US or France, depending on which um, area, um, to provide some better economic opportunities at home for people. We also, though, heard at our, our meeting you know, pleas from some of the African leaders to the US and Europe don't don't rob us of our best and brightest. And they weren't just talking about university degree people, they were talking about what characterizes migrants. It's the people with ambition who want a better life and who's going, who are going to really be able to do much better. And if all of them leave to come to the richer countries, it will make it much, much more difficult for the development. And they were asking for balance. Yes, give our people opportunities, but don't rob us of their skills. Mr. Chenings, would you like to add something? Yeah, as the question was in English, I'll answer in English. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think education is only really part of the problem. And one of the things that the labor movement and the NGOs that are represented at the forum this year in greater numbers in the past. When I first came here, there were three or four of us. Now we're getting more than 100, which is a good thing. There's this whole question of economic development and inequality in the global economy. And we have a situation where we have, I think the latest statistics are 550 million people living on less than a dollar a day. But if you take that up to $3 a day, the, the numbers go up to 2 billion. 2 billion. Therefore, I think we have to find new ways for economic development of which, of which education is a part. I'm not sure how familiar everybody in the audience is with this debt crisis that we refer to in Africa, that the, the debts that the governments have with financial institutions is such an extent that some of the countries are sending back to these global financial institutions sometimes 20, 30, 40 times more than they're spending on education. And what does that mean? That means that children are forced to leave school at the age of 12, that the teaching materials aren't available, so you're cutting off the life chances of whole generations of people. Bill Clinton was down the road the other day, and uh, he, he, was, uh, he heads uh, an AIDS foundation, and he said that the average amount spent on by for each African citizen is ten dollars a year that's it so education is one part of it but a more balanced economic development is another Mr. the Chair, rich, the rich yeah. world Thanks. the Thanks. rich world the rich world is not doing enough it doesn't win votes it was said today which which person which person Bill Clinton said it he said what politician is going to stand for election on a campaign for more assistance overseas. It's not going to happen. So we have to begin citizens' movements. We have to work with the NGOs for a much better balanced economic development. At the moment, the opportunities for millions of children are simply not there for education, for health care. And therefore, it's little wonder if they have access to televisions in the village that they see another world, that another world is presented to them, that they can smuggle themselves. Imagine children in Senegal trying to get into the undercarriage of aeroplanes because they've seen a better world somewhere else. Mr. Chavitel, I think you want to say something? 
Thank just, you, Madam President. I <laughs> just would like to, to say that I could not agree more with the point on education. Because when we talked about migrants and integration, education, youth at the youth level is absolutely critical. And we see some progresses in many countries where even illegal people are accepted at school. So that's a very good point. That being said, let me say that unfortunately on the planet, we have a billion two people living below one dollar a day, not half a million, more than a billion. So the challenge is bigger than we think. Yeah. Next question, please. Next question, please. My name is Tarek. My name is Alex Ghana. I have worked uh, in India, Nepal, and uh, Africa. I agree with what Mr. Biedermann uh, was saying that we have to deal with the root causes of the problem, and I'm very happy that. Mr. Alvata is here with us. I don't think we need so many security measures, or we wouldn't, if uh, we had so many people working like uh, your company is doing. Now, what about the tax uh, avoiders or tax evaders? And I know that a lot of people don't um, pay tax, and we forgot those kind of uh, migrants. And uh, there are 300 uh, people uh, on this uh, planet uh, who have more collective wealth than half the people uh, living on this planet. So a question to you, Mr. Biedermann, and to Mr. Chapitel, because you are NGOs. And I think that the NGOs uh, should not be just uh, combating the symptoms, but also looking at the root causes. I think that we need to deal with the family planning uh, together with other uh, measures. And uh, I contacted your colleague, uh, Mr. Reno, but he wasn't prepared to, to discuss this with me. Can you tell me why the Swiss uh, Red Cross has such great difficulty in uh, integrating what is a human right, family planning? Thank you for that question. I don't think that family planning is a human right, but uh, to come back uh, to your question, I don't think that we have any problems uh, in uh, dealing with family planning and AIDS prevention. And uh, in Switzerland, the Swiss Red Cross uh, has also organized uh, preventive courses for youth and uh, distribution of uh, condoms. And we really deal with these issues directly. As for HIV prevention in certain countries, in southern uh, Africa, for example, the problem is that you've got to get uh, past the taboo. And you've got to be able to get your message across. I don't think that Mr. Renoff uh, wasn't uh, prepared to go into a discussion, but not uh, with uh, individuals because of our experience we cannot simply address taboos directly we can do this indirectly we can try and do some spade work uh, first uh, and in Swaziland uh, which is one of the countries uh, really most affected uh, by HIV and I know that Mr. Ronoff has been uh, very concerned with uh, doing activities in this country there are possibilities of uh, doing something and when we can we do do HIV prevention and also we get involved in family planning in the process but you've got to be very careful not to allow yourself to be dragged into some kind of political discussion but where we can do this we do it next question please my name is Salvatore Pitai my name is uh, Salvatore Pitai I'm a journalist I'm interested in the IOM and found out quite a lot about it. But I'd like to come back to a point made by Mr. Charpitel. I think that recently an asylum camp had to be closed on the French side of the border because people were trying to be smuggled into the United Kingdom. 
What is your um, reaction to this? Now, Mr. McKinley, you know that uh, France and the United uh, Kingdom are members of the IOM, and I think that the IOM was responsible for the Center for Refugees um, being closed down. Why didn't you do something about that, Mr. McKinley? And yet, you are training uh, Turkish border guards, and uh, you are inviting uh, security experts from Ukraine. Why are you concentrate on security issues for states and not on the security for people? <laughs> Well, let's let's try to uh, work our way through some of these things. Um, uh, migration, if it's going to be orderly and managed, does require controls. The states have a, a right, indeed a duty, to uh, take charge of migration and manage it in an orderly fashion for the for the benefit of the citizens of the state. Uh, uh, the Swiss. Citizens are very interested in uh, in seeing migration matters managed very well. So are the citizens of all countries. They're all. It's a it's a uh, a public administration issue, and it's a political issue, and it's a social policy issue, which is very important. And I don't think anybody in this room ought to uh, imagine somehow that. Uh, the exercise of the authority of state and the community uh, in regard to managing migration is uh, a violation of anything at all. It's, uh, you have to have order and management in these systems, and that's what you elect and pay governments to do on your behalf. So it's not anything that anybody should apologize for. The Sangat Center, the French Red Cross Center in Sangat, uh, at the French end, of the uh, channel tunnel had turned into a very big problem, a very big problem for the authorities of the United Kingdom and a very big problem for the authorities of uh, the French Republic and a very big problem for the French Red Cross because in effect uh, it had become a staging ground for attempts by uh, migrants to get through the Channel Tunnel uh, under very hazardous uh, conditions most of the time, and if they made it, only to be arrested on the other end. It was it was not the right way to manage migration in any civilized society. Uh, and uh, when it was closed by uh, the French government, it wasn't because IOM told them to close it, believe me, and it wasn't, uh, as has been said here tonight, because the French were forced to do it uh, by the British, it was because it was obviously uh, uh, something which was attracting people into danger and was a, a big mess and a big example of how not to manage migration. You've got to be serious about it. This is a very serious social economic issue. You have to manage it in a serious and a humane fashion. I think Dr. Patel would agree with me. I, give, him a, give him a chance to, to say what he thinks about mm -hmm. the Sangat Center mm -hmm. as an example of uh, public policy related to migration management. Mr. McKinley, vielleicht uh, kann ich hier noch. Perhaps I can help out to here. I think that the question was also why your organization is so interested in uh, setting up a kind of shield. In other words, to prevent people getting into fortress Europe. Shouldn't one be a bit more proactive and not just defensive to stop the immigration taking place? I, I definitely agree with the question. I think it's very important that first the governments ensure compliance with the existing international and national legal framework to protect the refugees and migrants, including ratifying the Migrants Working uh, Workers Convention, which has been signed many years ago and ratified only by 20 countries. That's the first thing we should fight for and lobby for. Why only 20 countries? 
Permit. Why only 20 countries? I don't know the answer. Uh, does anybody know? All I know is that a, all I can tell you is that 140 countries signed the trade deal to liberalize services in Doha in a relatively short period of time. And Mr. McKinley's organization has been waiting so far, I think, 13 years. And guess what country, of all the nations in the world, what country was the country that became the 20th, which gives this more legal force, guess what country? The youngest country in the world, East Timor. It says a lot about this world we live in. Weitere Fragen, bitte, da hinten. Any other questions? I think at the back there is one. Stay now, schön. Uh, just a short comment and then the question. 550 million living below one dollar is just the figure for my country, India. Yes. And one billion is uh, world over. Uh, world Trade Organization's objective, chief objective is free flow of goods. Yeah. What is the panel? Uh, one or two panelists mentioned WTO also. Uh, shouldn't WTO have as its objective free flow of people, free flow of labor. And if that is so, may I request that a strong signal be sent to the WTO Director General, Mr. Supachai, who was here yesterday. Thank you. No, thank you. No, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, migration already is on the agenda, um, certainly the negotiations on the general agreement on trade and service. Um, there's a growing recognition that it's pretty hard to have free trade and services if the people who provide the services can't move from one country to another in order to do so. Um, I personally, though, would be very um, reluctant to see migration issues dealt with solely within a trade context. Um, I think Migration raises issues that are far broader um, than trade in goods raise. There are social and econ economic consequences to it that go well beyond the economics of trade. Um, however, I do think it's, it's not a particularly um, good idea that we have institutions that help governments negotiate and come to agreements with regard to movement of capital, movement of goods, movement of services, but not movement of labor. I think we really do need to work through the bilateral, regional, and multilateral ways in which we can manage this process so that both sending and receiving countries of migrants can benefit from the process, which is the concept behind the other um, institutions that have been established. That doesn't exist yet in the migration realm. I think we need to move there, but it's going to take quite a long time to get those agreements in place. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to agree with Susan Martin on that. Uh, uh, it, it is a goal of our organization. I think it's, uh, it's a direction that the world is going into to have freer, freer movement of people. But I would insist that it has to be uh, under rational management. It, it, can't, it can't be uh, a, a no borders regime where anybody is free to go anywhere they want. Uh, that would be chaos. And it, it is true that people, people are different from television sets or, or from pineapples. Um, th there are consequences to their movement and the human dimension has to be respected and has to be thought through in a rational fashion. So yes, I think the world will be a better, a better place if, if barriers to movement are, uh, are brought down and if well thought through and rational methods of managing migration flows for, in the interests of the migrants and of the receiving and, and uh, sending countries are developed. But uh, I think we're very far from seeing total free movement of people, and I'm not sure it would be such a good thing. It, it, it could cause some very serious uh, consequences, unintended consequences that would be, uh, uh, that would be regrettable. Free flow of people. That is part of the same package as a free uh, movement of goods, as far as I'm concerned. But we all know that uh, things can't be done overnight. 
And until we have integration, and you need integration on two sides, it's not a one-sided uh, operation. And unless we can achieve integration, then we'll probably have more problems and we'll find solutions to the problems. Nevertheless, I believe that too little is being done. One could uh, deal with more migration flows, but we need to do more for integrating people. And we've got to focus uh, um, integration. There's still too little being done, even in Switzerland. And we need to have an integration policy. And that should uh, be done in order to help uh, people with a different uh, culture and to integrate them, because this could be an enrichment uh, for the Swiss culture as well. But it has to be done in a reasonable manner. There's still a lot to be done. Then we still wouldn't have a free flow, but we would have a greater flow than we have today. Yeah. I'd like uh, just to say that uh, I support what Mr. Biedenmann is saying, but we're forgetting one thing. When we speak of a free flow of goods, don't forget that the other side has no obligation to buy my uh, pressure co cooker. I just have the right to sell it. And in the case of free movement of people, people obviously have to have an opportunity to be able to develop themselves. Of course, you can't uh, compare people to products, and you've got to be able to integrate these people if they come into Switzerland. But it hasn't to be an obligation. Perhaps I can conclude the discussion. We've already exceeded the, the time allotted to, to us. Thank you very much uh, for your participation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, panelists. And thank you also to the uh, Human Rights uh, Group uh, for the statement they made at the beginning. And thank you also for uh, discussing uh, things with us rather than trying to disrupt things. So thank you very much to all of you. And I hope you continue uh, to have a good time here in Davos and with the WEF. Thank you.